enthusiasts, Lauren here. Before we get to Gretchen's great interview with Hilaria Cruz today, I have two exciting pieces of news to share with you. The first is that we have a date for our Melbourne live show. We'll be at the State Library of Victoria on Friday the 16th of November. I'm also very excited to share with you that we are doing a live show in Sydney as well. We'll be at Giant Dwarf on Monday the 12th of November. For more details and links to tickets, go to lingthusiasm.com slash show. Our patrons will get a couple of free tickets and we're looking forward to meeting them and all of you as well. We're also super excited to be able to share with you some new Lingthusiasm merchandise that we've been working on, which was another Patreon goal of ours. We are very excited to bring you the Space Babies and Space Pigeon from episode one of the show in full and glorious animated colour on a range of merchandise available through our site. You can see the images, find out more about the illustrations and our wonderful illustrator Lucy Maddox by visiting lingthusiasm.com slash merch. And now over to Gretchen. Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch, and I'm here with Dr. Hilaria Cruz, who is a Newcomb Fellow at Dartmouth College and just starting as an assistant professor in linguistics at the University of Louisville, and he's a native speaker of Chitino, who works with Chitino as well. So, uh, welcome, Hilaria. Well, thank you. Hello, everyone. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. You are welcome. Uh, and I'm here because you invited me down for a workshop at Dartmouth, and so we're going to talk about that as well. But first, let's start with, how did you get into linguistics? As a native speaker of Chatino, I grew up in a community where we all spoke Chatino, and then it came time for us to go to school, and then my father says, well, I would like you to get an education. So my father then says... We're going to go to this other town named Hukila, so you guys can go to school. Uh, we came to Hukila, and at the time, in the 1970s, the Mexican government wanted indigenous children to study. So they developed these, like, boarding schools. Not, it, wasn't like a, it was like a boarding houses where indigenous children that came from the outskirts of these Spanish-speaking towns and I uh, had uh, room and board while they went to public school. So my family came to this uh, boarding school. They housed us there. And I was sent to elementary school not knowing a word of Spanish. So it was a complete immersion. Wow. And at the time, there was just one school uh, in that little town, just one elementary school for, I would say, like... Um, I'm just guessing like 5,000 people. So there were many children. There were some children that went to school in the morning. There were some children that went to school in the evening. Mm. So, so since I did not know a word of Spanish, so my father took me there and introduced me to this, uh, to this class. The teacher was uh, nice. And then so I just, as a warm up, so he let me go there for a few mornings. So I would just go mm -hmm. just for a few hours. How and then I would you? just... I think that I was about seven. Uh -huh. So I would just hang out for a few hours and, and I would just take off and go mm -hmm. back to the boarding house where my parents were also staying with us. And then so the, the teacher uh, says, oh, this is fine, but I think that you are ready to begin your regular classes now. So you are going to come to school from two to six. So then I began to get really sad because I did not want to go to school because I used to get bored just to mm -hmm. sit down there and just kind of uh, not understand what the teacher says. So then I began to go to these uh, evening classes, and I was not happy. So then I decided that I want to go back to the morning class because it was the same teacher teaching first grade in the morning and then in the evening. Mm -hmm. So I will go back, and he will welcome me. Oh, hi, yes, come in. So I will go, like, for two, three hours in the morning, as you know, as much as I wanted. So then I will <laughs> go back again back home and to me I, that was the happy medium for me right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. so then at some point then he stopped me and he says no 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 you you cannot you know set up your own time you you must come back here you know um to school so you i go to school I, you play the rules <laughs> yes uh, to me it was just school was just horrible but i guess i persisted and i got really bored and i 
I guess I, I passed, and then I, uh, when we got uh, when we got to sixth grade, then uh, there was. Uh, I guess in that school, it was only middle school, but um, actually my family and I were not happy in that town because that was the first place where I encountered racism against um, uh, Native people. Mm -hmm. Because in my community, I was just a member of society, right? But mm -hmm. when when we got to school, you know, like kids began to pinch me and they would say, call me India and things like that. Oh, that's like terrible, pejorative yeah. words. So I would come back to my father and say, why is it that these kids are saying this to me? Mm -hmm. You know, why is it that they're pinching me and taunting me because I, I just did yeah. not understand. Yeah. So then my father would say, you know, like uh, every time they tell you that, just be proud of yourself. But how can a kid be proud? Of? How, uh, yeah. can, how can you be proud if somebody's taunting you, right? So mm. that was my experience in that town. It was like a frontier town. You know, there mm. was a lot of racism towards the Chatino people who lived in the outskirts of that town. So then, you know, I told my father and my uh, siblings too, you know what, we're not happy in this town. So then, uh, and says, uh, he told us, well, you know, I understand that you're not happy, so let's go to the city. So we went to the city, and there was a more cosmopolitan, you know, there were, we lived in a small area of the city where, you know, like, uh, there were a lot of migrants from indigenous communities, so it was better. So then mm -hmm. I continued my education, and so my father and I will talk, and he encouraged me to continue college, because he told me that in college, it will be a lot of fun, that in college, I will be able to uh, talk to a lot of people and meet a lot of people. So I was excited about mm. going to college. So I continued my education because I wanted to meet interesting people in college. That was, that was my whole <laughs> goal. Okay, you know, that okay. Was my whole goal. That's a good goal. I like that yeah, goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I wanted to have interesting conversations, meet interesting people in yeah, college. That, yeah, that's great. So I, I, I like think that. that my father was very smart in doing that. <laughs> he knew you very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. so. So my goal was to get to college and have wonderful conversations and meet interesting people. Mm -hmm. So I continue going and I continue going to college and then um, in 1991 I came to to the United States and then I began to hear conversations about linguists working with uh, Native American languages reviving these Norman languages and then I began to think you know what maybe linguists will be able to help me create an alphabet for the Chatino language oh. because I you know I was very curious about how to represent the Chatino languages but the only thing that I was familiar with was the Spanish alphabet right. but, uh, but since these languages come from such different uh, linguistic families, Spanish does not have uh, all of the um, uh, symbols to be able to represent a tonal language, let's say, like yeah, Latino. Sure. So then, you know, we would try to write it down, but it was when it, it came time to read it, we could not read it. So there it's was kind of something missing yeah. there. So there was something missing there. So I began to think, you know what, this sounds very interesting. I, mm. I think that linguists could help me. Um, maybe uh, write, uh, find a way to write the Chatino language. So then I began to to write to different linguists and mm. I would write them letters and say, yes, could you please help me develop an alphabet for my okay. language? And this is 1991, so you're writing letters. Uh, well, and emails, it was maybe? later. It was yeah. later. It was like um, it was like I was writing e uh, emails around like 2000 or something like okay, that. Okay. It, it was yeah. in, in 1991. So I began to, to write these letters in 2000. So... My sister Emiliana also was on the same path. It was mm -hmm. interesting because my oh, sister Emiliana, amazing. you know, I would talk about all these things and I thought that I was the, the first one, but she mm -hmm. quietly, she had the same oh. idea. <laughs> <laughs> but she was more proactive. Well, I, we were both, you know, working on our own ends. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So Emiliana was in Oaxaca City then. Mm -hmm. She uh, she had a little coffee shop down there and then... Uh, in uh, there walks in this um, this American uh, guy, whose name is Joel Scherzer, the uh, professor Joel Scherzer from. Uh, he used to teach um, at the University of Texas in anthropology department. But Joel mm -hmm. Scherzer is a, a wonderful, very friendly guy. So mm -hmm. Joel Scherzer began to uh, strike a, a conversation with Emiliana. And then, uh, so he, uh, Joel asked Emiliana, so tell me about you, you know, what are you interested in? So then Emiliana says, well, you know what, I would love to be able to study my language. Mm. And, uh, and Joel says, well, uh, that sounds very interesting. Tell me more about it. Because we at the University of Texas are very interested in working with native speakers of Mexico. So actually we're creating a program. Why don't you come and visit oh us God. at the University of Texas? So Emiliana went to Texas. She, she joined the anthropology department in, uh, at the University of 
Texas. Ah. So then, so Emiliana began her program at the University of Texas, and we were just all very excited because then we met Anthony Woodbury, who mm. was uh, very interested in working with us with Chitino. And then Emiliana says, well, you know, in our in our studies of Chitino, we need linguists. I think that you should join the linguistics department. <laughs> so she recruited you yeah, 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 to yeah. do the sticks part. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was, yeah, 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 yeah. So then, so I said, sure. Yeah, I okay. would love to do that. Is she your older sister? No, she's younger. Oh, wow. <laughs> but she always tells me what to do. So that is how I uh, I joined the linguistics department. I was doing field work with them. I was not a linguistics student or anything like that. I was just like, I accompanied them because I was just so excited that they were studying Chatino and this is something that I always wanted to do. So I began to do field work. So I paid my own way and I just went Oh in my there. God. So you were like the consultant they were like asking you questions about no, Chatino? No, no, no. no, you were just no, no. like doing with them for fun. Uh, I was just doing it for fun, no. But we also did, they also did, uh, and this was in the summer of 2003, so they did field work. So Emiliana oh, was okay. in school, I was not. I was just like a lay person but who was like so excited about this, you know, because this was always what I wanted to do, right? Yeah. Like, I was just so excited about it. So Emiliana told me, hey, we're going to go down there and we're going to do field work. And I said, I'll come. So I paid my own way. So I went in there. <laughs> and then, so since Emiliana had placed this idea on me that I needed to study linguistics, then I asked Tony, hey, you know, uh, do you think that I could join the linguistics department? He's, and then he says to me, well, you're going to have to apply, but if you're ready to work hard, we might accept you. <laughs> <laughs> did you speak English at this point? Yes, I did. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. yes. So, uh, so that's how I began to study Oh, that's so cool. So then you became a grad student at the University of Texas. Uh, this is how I began a grad student in linguistics at the University of Texas in Austin. Oh, cool. That's really neat. And then you, like, you know, wrote a dissertation about Tatino and, like, learned a lot of stuff, including how to write it. Yeah, so one of the things that I wanted to do was to describe the poetics of Chatino. Well, at the time, I we didn't call it poetics. I, uh, one of the things that I grew up with, and what Joel Cerce calls speech, verbal art is what, uh, is what he calls it. Speech. In which is, uh, well, he wrote a book on speech playing verbal art. So this is a title of a book that Joel Cerce wrote. But basically, he used to call it verbal art. So verbal, verbal art. Oh, so yeah. by, by what he meant by verbal art is just to take into account like the different types of speech speech styles that exist in one community. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I saw in growing up in San Juan Quiaije, that there are so many like different types of um, of discourse. You know, like uh, we have ceremonial discourse, we have uh, political discourse, mm -hmm. we have dialogues, you know, it, Exchanges. So, um, so I wanted to record some of those uh, discourses because some of those. Um, so, what gets transmitted in many of those discourses is um, the need to preserve uh, tradition. Like, for example, mm -hmm. there's always a pair of lines that the orator says, you know, this is our tradition. This is uh, what the elders left for us since the foundation of the community, since the foundation of the mountains. And, and to leave this tradition will be seen bad. So mm -hmm. uh, as a Chatino speaker, every time I hear these ceremonial speeches, they resonate with me a lot. So I wanted to record that. So the first assignment that I had and the first summer when I was in, in graduate school was I proposed to record record uh, political speech. So mm. I went back to my community. I recorded political speech and that at uh, the changing of the authority. So I did my master's thesis on that. And then for my dissertation, I did like um, ethnography of speech. Or speech, like I describe the different patterns of oh, instructions. like all the different and, genres, yeah, the, the different of. genres, and the, it was like the, describing the ecosystem of the different styles oh, of speech really in the community. So, and I, I work with uh, very gifted and talented speakers, and um, this is, is, is something that I really wanted to do. And uh, it was a lot of work, but uh, <laughs> 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 yes, but uh, it was. Uh, I think that uh, a very important uh, work, and you know, so I have the basis now to be able to. Continue continue that kind of work of all the, for all the people to do the same. Yeah. yeah, so we can we can link to your dissertation, but that's also kind of how you got into, oh my gosh, it's really hard to work with audio data. That is right, you know, because it was hard for two reasons to be able to transcribe speech. I was, of course, a native speaker of the language, so I mm -hmm. knew what they were saying, but the problem was when it was time to commit this language, 
on the paper was that I was just a beginning writer. I mean, we were just right. in the stages of developing the alphabet for the language and then also learning linguistics. And then Anthony Woodbury, he is very meticulous at what he does. So he will say, well, you know, uh, what is the alphabet that you want to use? So <laughs> there were like two, three choices of alphabet. Oh. So if you're going to choose one, you're going to have to be consistent. I was right. just beginning. It was just... Uh, That's it so was, hard it for was, a beginner too. It, yeah. was just, it was tough. But um, another thing that I noticed was that it was just very time consuming to be able to be transcribing uh, these texts. And so this is something that I began to realize when I began to transcribe these texts. Like in my um, dissertation, I offered transcriptions of five to six uh, ceremonial texts. All of these are Which ceremonial be long texts. speeches. Yeah, these are long speeches and different, um, and different genres. Yeah, because I know when we're doing for the podcast, we make transcriptions for the podcast. Uh, so we put the audio onto YouTube, actually, and we use YouTube's automatic speech recognition to create the first draft of the transcript. And then we have a person who goes in and corrects it because there's all these corrections they need to make. For one thing, YouTube never recognizes the name of the podcast, Lingthusiasm, because it's yes. not a real word. Yeah, <laughs> And so it gives us these crazy things about, like, Link Susie as in. <laughs> <laughs> that is so and, like, who is Susie? Why is she here? <laughs> But we're lucky because we have so the you're, automatic you're lucky. Cans, you're, you know, transcripts. At least, you know, like, at least you have, like, this is news to me. Like, this is the first time I hear the process by which you do transcriptions. Of your but it like, still takes hours and we're still paying a human to do hours of, you know, detailed work making the transcripts, even though we cut out half of it by having an automatic thing create the first draft that that person can then fix. That is so interesting. I wish I had a tool like that for Chatino, you know, like at least something that could help me. So just to give me a little hand so I won't get carpal tunnel. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, I bet. And it's probably hard for you to hire, you know, Chatino speaking research assistants here in the U.S. because I don't imagine there are a lot of them. Well, it's not only that, but since in Mexico, as part of the creation of a nation state, their policy has been to integrate indigenous people into this national language, which is Spanish. So then when students go to school, the language of instruction is Spanish. They right. don't know how to read and write in Chatino. So, so even if they're speaking Chatino, that you have to teach them how to read and write first. Yes, that's right. If, if, you know, if they can be of you know, help. Yeah, absolutely. So, and that's part of what you're doing this weekend. That is right. Yes. So then what happened? Uh, we continue to do research at the uh, University of Texas, and we develop a very strong program of um, Chatino studies there. We used to call ourselves the Chatino Gang. Uh, <laughs> there have been like eight dissertations on different Chatino languages that came out at oh, the University great. of Texas from one or two very sporadic work in Chatino. So there were like eight very in-depth studies. And one of those works was by Lina Hu and Kate Mesh, and they were studying sign language and gesture. Mm. And um, Lina Hu is um, a signer herself, and so she will use transcribers in any any spoken language, whether it's English, Spanish, or Chatino. Right. So she was doing her dissertation on language acquisition and socialization of deaf children in San Juan Quiaija in my community. So then she asked me to transcribe her uh, the audio interviews that she was doing with the families. And these were like really lengthy interviews. But then I took that uh, very uh, seriously because I, you know, like I said, you know, like I'm Lena's ears and mm -hmm. I have to re do this transcription really faithfully yeah. so she can get access to, to this language. So in taking that um, work really seriously to allow her access. So I began to do the transcription, but then at that point, it became to me much uh, more like poignant to be able to have some tool that could help me because it was just a lot of work. So then like I made a comment on Facebook, hey, you know what? It's, you know, like I, I see that automatic speech recognition is just very developed in English and all of these languages. How can we get a tool to be able to uh, transcribe uh, this text in Chatino? I, you know, I really don't care. I would love to just have a tool that says, thing in Chatino because they were repeating these things cha, cha, like all the time oh. and it was just like oh my god I, I you know I, I just want to have something that you could at least recognize a few words so that <laughs> I don't have to type all of these words I mean like because the estimates that I've seen for how long it takes to do a transcript are like one hour of transcriber work for one minute of audio yes and yes. that's the kind of work yes. so if someone has an hour of audio data that's 60 hours yeah 
of work to try to transcribe right. that one hour. That's right. No, which is it, ridiculous. Yeah, it's very laborious. So then I began to ask people, and then I, um, in talking to, with some linguists, they will say, well, you know, um, uh, it's very difficult to uh, to do speech recognition in small languages because uh, the models such as uh, force alignment, which is a model that uh, they had been using at the time, needed like hundreds if not thousands of hours of text and we did not have that mm-hmm. and because um, the, that's the whole that's right. point of it being a small language right. you don't have those kind of resources yes and um so then i began to think well how can we make it how can we as speakers of minority languages make it or facilitate or invite these people who are doing these um, automatic speech recognition research to be able to do collaborations and to help us creating tools mm-hmm. um so then I went to several meetings and I met uh, the people who um, run linguist lists, Damir and Gosha, Damir Chavar and, uh, and Gosha Chavar. Mm-hmm. It seems like they have some interest in, in, in doing ASR. And it seems like when I talked to them and I told them about the problem, that they said, oh, yes, I think that this could be possible. You know, it seems like it wasn't a challenge for them. So they invited me at IU, Indiana University. And one of the interesting things that we did with uh, Damir and Gosha there, which I did not encounter with before was that Damir thought that we could entice people who were doing computational linguistics if we offer some data in open access. Hmm, okay. So then what I did there was that we had a little recording, and then I respoke many of the texts that, that I have transcribed for my dissertation first. Mm-hmm. So I reread them, and then we put them again into... Um, into Ilan, and then we we put all the we annotated them with parts of speech and just cut and paste. So you respoke them like in an audio booth, so you'd have higher sound quality, or was it just slower? Well, the facil- we didn't have an audio booth. It was just a nice uh, recording. Or like a nice quiet in room a, compared to of, like yeah. being outside where they yeah. might have been recorded yes. the first time. Yeah, it wasn't. Yes, it was a nice recording, and uh, we had a good tape recorder basically. Oh, okay, okay. So 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 I respoke them. In a, like high quality, in, a slow sort of like yeah, a yeah, something like that. Careful. I tried to you know re reread the text, and so we compiled a corpus of uh, three point five hours, mm-hmm. which uh, we put in this uh, program called Gorilla, where people can just download it and they can use it mm. uh, to do you know any any type of research that they want to, and I thought that that was uh, very clever and. Because uh, Damir says, well, you know, we need to allow people to have a, a, a nice corpus and then so that they can use uh, so that they can use it if they wish to add uh, a different language into their models. So and that so do what, people start using it? or? And I, this is how I came into contact with the people that I'm working with right now. Um, so at some point, also um, Alexei um, Mich- Michaud, mm-hmm. uh, who works on, uh, on a group of languages called Yongnina, he was also uh, asking the same question. You know, oh, okay. uh, he's, a, he's a linguist, he's a phonetician, and he was working with these languages. And he also uh, wanted to do some automatic speech recognition for the languages that he was working with. And where are they spoken? In China. In China, okay. Yes, so the Na languages are spoken in China. So he also put some high quality data. Uh, also, you know, like um, open, out there on the know, internet, the, yeah, yeah, out there on the internet, and that is how he got connected with Oliver Adams, who is one uh, of the okay. co-organizers for this conference that I have right now, uh, that I'm doing right now. So Oliver Adams got in touch with um, Alexis, with Alexis, and then uh, so they began to do this um, uh, collaboration. But then it came time when they wanted to to feed their model with another language that was also a tonal language. Uh And we had this corpus that we had developed with a linguist list. And which with was Chatino, also yeah. with Chatino, with open access, with one speaker, me. Which is also a tonal language. Which is also a tonal language. And actually and it's completely unrelated to this language yeah, in China. And, and actually spoken by a comparable size of a population, ah. like 40,000 people, kind of yeah. like that. 40, 50,000 people. So that is how we began this collaboration. 
And so is the idea to make tools that could work regardless of what the language is, or you have to kind of like, so it'll work on, you know, young Nina, it'll work on Chatino, it'll work on some other language, it doesn't matter? Or is it kind of to figure out how much data you need to train, like a very small amount of data, and then it works specifically on the language? Or like- Yes, well, actually, the, um, the methods that Oliver Adams is using is neural networks. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, so, so he developed this um, this software called Persephone, and with Persephone, then you can um, input, you know, uh, a data on, you know, um, I guess on, in this case, he was interested in tonal languages, so maybe he developed some tools so that the uh, model could recognize tonal languages. So that's why he kind of fed uh, two tonal languages into the model and to see what kind of outputs uh, they had. Yeah. And it seems like uh, uh, with... Um, Alec, uh, the, the corpus that Alexa was uh, working with, uh, the output was just excellent because he was um, he used more data, but uh, uh, but the output in Chatino was also very good. It's very oh, promising. Good. So it's useful for you if you're if, to make a first draft of a transcript or something. For I you? think that it will be very useful. I have not. Um, Use it to transcribe new data, and this is the reason why at the retreat we are going to find out how can we, uh, who are not technologically savvy people, can start using and training uh, okay. uh, these models with new data. So, uh, so the t- retreat, the goal is to bring together kind of the automatic speech recognition people and the minority language documentation people and say, okay, how can we help each other? How can we make these tools that will work for everything? How can we collaborate? How can Mm. we make tools for language documentation? Yes, because uh, on the one hand, we linguists are not, uh, we don't know how to operate these models. And the engineers, they know how to, you know, like work these systems. So the two of us are going to come together and we're going to have an honest conversation. Like we linguists will say, how would you like us to prepare our data so you can Mm. use it for your models? So they will tell us and vice versa. This is what we need. And you have people working on like multiple different languages and multiple different kind of technology type things all together. Yeah, that, that's right. You know, like in my conversations with Oliver Adams um, right now, uh, ASR tools for uh, major languages is very advanced. So a, a lot of the problems have been solved. And actually, there is many uh, subspecialties within the, the, that field. Like, for example, one of the interests that Oliver Adams is um, multilingual ASR. So for oh. him, this is so interesting because we're going to have different speakers. Like, we're going to have um, speakers of Chatino languages, speakers of Mayan languages. So basically, uh, what Oliver Adams says, that many of the differences sometimes could even be anatomical. So he, he should explain more what he means. <laughs> so but, for uh, multilingual automatic speech recognition, is that an automatic speech recognition tool that works for multiple languages? Like at the same time, yeah, so if I you're so. so if you're speaking Chatino one minute and Spanish another minute, and you, let's say you also happen to speak a Mayan language, you could speak to it in any of those languages, and it would be able to pick up correctly whatever you were doing. You know, I'm really new in this field, so I really cannot. <laughs> this is the whole that, hope, yes, maybe. Yeah. yeah, you know, I, I think we need to ask uh, okay, you know okay. ASR people these particular questions. Yeah, but it would be great yes. if it would work for multiple languages. That would be really yes, cool. Yes, yeah. actually, there is the new frontier. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because there's, you know, six, seven thousand languages in the world, and there's, what, like, maybe ten that you have really good automatic speech recognition tools for right That's now? That's right, yes. Yes, but the thing is that still, you know, like, for uh, minority languages, there are certain requirements that need to be there in place first. Like, with Chatino, it was easy to do this because I have prepared the corpus. Mm-hmm. There is an alphabet that we have for Chatino, so we have uh, now research in Chatino, but many of those languages do not have these uh, uh, this research available. So even if you have a sound file that is not transcribed of a language, it will not be useful. Because for you do need to, like yes. some training data. Yeah, no, you do train data and also you need a person who evaluates the output of, of the model. Right, because yes. then you can't fix it if it's... That's right. Like, for example, in the way we work with Oliver was that, you know, like he put this data on and then I as a person, as a speaker, I went out and just kind of evaluated what kind of the output of the of the system. So it has to be like reciprocal is, yeah. And so what's like in, you know, 20 years when this is amazing and everything works great. Oh, <laughs> what what's what's the vision for how this works? Is it so people who speak Chatino can say, you know, okay Google to their phones and it'll in Chatino and it will reply back or Well, 
I mean, you know, people can give it, you know, many uses, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if I can say what kind of uses, you know, people can give it if we, you know, were able to get to that point. But on a personal level, I I would love to be able to have a tool that could help me transcribe uh, text that I have because actually we have hundreds of hours of recordings of uh, Chatino uh, text, and it'll be wonderful to be able to have these transcriptions and uh, the um the results of these transcriptions could be fed into ongoing dictionaries oh, uh, okay. to study uh, the syntax of the language, to study uh, morphology or other different aspects of the grammar. Or to make books or these kinds of things in the language. To make books in the language. Like, for example, we have recorded many stories that uh, they're sitting there. We haven't been able to transcribe them. It would be nice if we had like a nice transcription of the story so then we can work in our artist. Uh, and make children's books and uh, develop all of these materials to promote the language. Yeah, because you've made some books already, right? That is right. We just had uh, some books uh, published and uh, with the help of many people. And I'm just so proud of this because this is one of the first times that I see like children's books in Chatino. And they are so beautiful. They are really beautiful. You yes. show, you're showing to me, them to me earlier That's and they're right. really lovely. Yes. This is a project that I did with my students in a language revitalization class that I taught in the winter 2018 at Dart, uh, Dartmouth College. And so one of the first things that we did was to, to do the drawings on cloth books. So each student developed their own theme and they put it on cloth books. And then we had uh, an exhibition and then uh, the exhibition was a success. It was uh, really beautiful. People loved it. The cloth books look so cool. Like they, <laughs> they're soft and you can, yeah, <laughs> you know, right. a baby couldn't destroy them. That's right. And then I got some funding from the Newcomb Foundation to do the publication in a different format of these books. And uh, one of the students uh, had to draw pictures for many of the books because uh, the original were just images that students pull out of uh, you know, the, from internet, the internet, from the internet somewhere, because we were not thinking forward about publications and things right. like that. But when we realized that we needed to publish them and that Newcomb was offering some uh, funding to publish them, that we realized that we did not... Uh, um, when I get uh, the institution. You don't want to get to sued. Yeah, sued, you know. Like, uh, so now we have these new books with completely new images, and they are and they're lovely, and they're yes. and they're they're Creative Commons and they're open yes, license. That's right. So you've had a few of those books be translated into other languages that don't have enough children's books. That's right, because I had native speakers of North American languages. In my class, I had um, a student who spoke Klingit. I, there was another student who spoke Kupa and Ojibwe. And when they saw this, they realized that they wanted to do the same version in oh, their own so languages. Cool. It was just really amazing. So so all of these books just came out. So now there's this little link between the Klingit speakers and the Hupa speakers and the Ojibwe speakers and the Chatino speakers. They'll all have the same pictures in their books with the words in their own language. It is just so amazing. You know... I, I went back to Mexico and I took the the cloth books um, down to Oaxaca, and uh, there was this friend from my community who came to visit. I was visiting my mom in Oaxaca, so he came to visit, and then I sat down with him and I read him the, the one of the children's books. And then at the end, he says to me, "You know, it is so sad." He says that our language is getting lost. Mm. So that is um, so really like the books really bring these conversations about uh, the importance of language. And if the kids are, because probably a lot of the kids still kind of speak the language at home, but then when they go to school and the only language they see written down is Spanish, whereas if they could see also written versions of Chatino so they could be bilingual and know that there's you know, people who care about the language and give it more prestige and these kinds of things. That is right. You know, like I grew up in Mexico hearing that indigenous languages were not languages because mm. they did not have a writing system. So that is why I wanted to develop an alphabet to show that this is a legitimate language. And by having this cute little books. It's really and they amazing. look very professional, too. You know, of they're, course, yeah. they're, they're shiny. And they that's, look very professional right. looking. Yeah, yeah. So we wanted to, you know, like to make Chatino look uh, good. And so in this conversation that I had this with this uh, person from my community, so then I said to him, you know, like one of the worries that I have, I said, if I distribute this book in the community, is that many of the books that I see, like textbooks that uh, the schools give for free, mm -hmm. they all end up in the toilet. So oh. then I said, you know, one of the worries that I have is that uh, my book will uh, end up in the toilet. Yeah. And then he said to me very seriously, you know what, I'm going to tell you one thing. He says, I read the Bible. 
I do not take the Bible uh, in the toilet. The Bible in my house has a special place. Mm. This book will be next to the Bible. What a compliment. Yes. That is so meaningful. It was just really beautiful. Yes. So I want to use these books to promote the language. One of the things that I would like to do, since this is a personal uh, endeavor, Mm -hmm. and I I don't have the backing of the state, I don't have um, unlimited uh, resources, I would like to uh, enlist uh, families in the community Mm to be able to read the books and then take videos of them interacting with the, ah. with the books and reading them with their children, take videos and then, with their permission, upload them on social media and this way promote. And they can reading. see it because I think this is the thing: is like the technology space seems like it's so dominated by just a few languages. And to say, okay, this can be a language of technology and this can be a language of of writing and of the future that you can keep passing on to your kids. That is right. Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes put little videos saying little phrases in Chatino. Mm. There is a lot of um, Chatinos who have migrated to the States Mm -hmm. and they have children. And some of them are teaching Chatino to their children. Apparently, I have some toddlers that follow my little oh videos, my gosh. and they just watch it over and over, and they repeat the words. Oh my God! You're yeah. like their 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 teacher, their grandma. Yes, but I, I wish I could do more. It's just very sporadic. Oh, yeah, but that's that's still so cool. So if you can get other people making videos as well, you know, maybe that helps. Yes. Uh, yeah. Or you know, like. Uh, just make these these books uh, in in different forms, like um, make little like um, or digital animation, versions of them or something. Like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's very cool. I've taken a photo of the books already, so we will share a photo of the books, and we'll also link to whatever website or something you have set up for those, so people can go see them and yes. you can see uh, what they look like. And you know what? One of the most important things about this is that uh, this, as you say, this is uh, these books have a created common license. So if someone out there would like to create children's books, they can use the same images mm. and uh, just put their own text and use the same things to you know publish their own books for their own language. Yeah, that's really great. Uh, so hopefully you'll get you know photos being sent in from around the world of people. People doing that. That would be amazing. <laughs> that would be amazing. Yes. Uh, send Hilaria your photos if you end up using them. <laughs> yeah, that would be All right. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to Lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. And Lauren tweets and blogs as Superlinguo. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistics questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate it if you can rate us on iTunes or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our audio producer is Claire Gaughan. Our editorial producers are Emily Graff and A.E. Prevo. And our production assistants are Celine Yoon and Fabian Anderberg. And our music is by The Triangles. Stay enthusiastic! Stay enthusiastic.